Exposition by Charles Hedden Spurgeon, Nehemiah 1, 2, 1, 8. Verses 1, 2. The words of Nehemiah the son of Hakaliah. And it came to pass in the month Chisle, in the twentieth year, as I was in Shushan the palace, that Hanani, one of my brethren came, he and certain men of Judah, and I asked them concerning the Jews that had escaped, which were left in captivity, and concerning Jerusalem. This good man was, of course, one of the banished Jews, but he had greatly prospered. He had risen in the empire of Ahasuerus until he had come to be great, even to be one of the chamberlains of the empire. But his heart was towards his poor people, his fellow Jews that were in poverty. Now, whenever God exalts a Christian in a temporal position, he ought not to disown his poor brethren, but his heart should go out towards them to see what he can do for them. It is a shame for any man to forget his country. Does not the Pole still say, No, Poland, you shall never perish? And we admire such patriotism. And the same feeling should be in every Christian breast. We should love the Church of God even as Nehemiah loved the chosen race from which he had sprung. So when he met with Hanani, the conversation was all about the poor brethren that remained at Jerusalem. 3. And they said unto me, The remnant that are left of the captivity there in the province are in great affliction and reproach, the wall of Jerusalem also is broken down, and the gates thereof are burned with fire. A sad story they had to tell. Ezra had assisted in somewhat rebuilding the temple, but little had been done for the private dwellings and for the walls and public buildings of the city. It was in a sad and wretched state and the Jews were despised and reproached. Nehemiah was a great man, but he was sorry to hear this. He felt as if he was a fellow sufferer with his poor brethren. 4. And it came to pass, when I heard these words, that I sat down and wept, and mourned certain days, and fasted, and prayed before the God of heaven. Was it his concern? Was it any more his concern than that of other men? Yes, he felt it to be his, and the tender heart which he had towards the people of God made him feel it to be peculiarly his. If nobody else did anything, he must. And, oh, dear brothers and sisters in Christ, whenever you see the cause of God in a sad estate, lay it to heart, weep, lament and pray, feel that you have an interest in it. Christ is your Saviour. Of the Church you are a part. These blessed interests of sovereign mercy belong to you. Take them to yourself and say, by God's help, I will lay myself out for the progress of his cause. I sat down and wept, and mourned certain days, and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. 5, 6. And said, I beseech you. O Lord God of heaven, the great and terrible God, that keeps covenant and mercy for them that love him and observe his commandments, let your ear now be attentive, and your eyes open, that you may hear the prayer of your servant, which I pray before you now, day and night, for the children of Israel, your servants and confess the sins of the children of Israel, which we have sinned against you, both I and my father's house have sinned. He seems to act like a priest for God, taking the sin of the people upon himself and confessing it. If they were hard-hearted, and would not confess, he would, and pour out his complaint before God. 7.10. We have dealt very corruptly against you, and have not kept your commandments, nor the statutes, nor the judgments which you commanded your servant Moses. Remember, I beseech you the word that you commanded your servant Moses, saying, If you transgress, I will scatter you abroad among the nations. But if you turn unto me and keep my commandments and do them, though there were of you cast out unto the uttermost part of the heavens, yet will I gather them from there and will bring them unto the place that I have chosen to set my name there. Now these are your servants and your people, whom you have redeemed by your great power, and by your strong hand. 
you see what an admirable prayer this is. There is a full confession of sin, an acknowledgement of the justice of God in having punished his people. But then there is a quoting of the divine word, a putting of the Lord in remembrance that he had made such and such a promise. That is the very backbone of prayer. If you go to the bank, the main part of the transaction is to put the check, the note of hand, upon the counter. You get no money otherwise. So when you go in prayer, the main part of prayer must lie in pleading the promise, you have said it. You have said it. Hold God to his word with a sacred daring of faith. You have promised. You have declared. Now be as good as your word. Then notice another plea he has. He says he is pleading for God's servants, his redeemed, redeemed by great power. Oh, it should always make us feel strong in prayer when we recollect that God's people are very dear to him and he has done great things for them, therefore he loves them and for those whom he loves, surely he will work great deliverances. These are arguments. There ought to be great argument in prayer if we hope to prevail. 11. O Lord, I beseech you, let now your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant, and to the prayer of your servants who desire to fear your name, and prosper, I pray you, your servant this day, and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. That was King Artaxerxes, whom he rightly viewed as a man, for, great as he was, all potent king of Persia, yet still but a man. Nehemiah consoles himself in the prospect of having to go in before him to ask favor at his hands. 11. For I was the king's cupbearer. Nehemiah 2, 1. And it came to pass in the month Nisn. Three or four months after he began to pray. 1. In the twentieth year of Artaxerxes the king, that wine was before him, and I took up the wine, and gave it unto the king. We have in some of the old slabs and carvings some singular pictures of the dainty way in which the kings of Persia and Media were served by their cupbearers. They always spilled a little wine upon their left hand and drank first, for fear the king should be poisoned. So the greatest men of the different provinces of the empire were called by turns to act this part before the king. It was a piece of state ceremony. 1. Now I had not been before time sad in his presence. And there was a law, one of those stupid median laws, that no man was to come before the king with a sad countenance. It was supposed that the king must be so serenely happy, himself, that none might come there unless they were happy, too. Nehemiah had been able to obey this rule, but on this occasion he did not because he could not. 2.6. Therefore the king said unto me, Why is your countenance sad, seeing you are not sick? This is nothing else but sorrow of heart. Then I was very sore afraid, and said unto the king, Let the king live forever, why should not my countenance be sad, when the city, the place of my father's sepulchres, lies in waste? and the gates thereof are consumed with fire. Then the king said unto me, For what do you make request? So I prayed to the God of heaven. And I said unto the king, If it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor in your sight, that you would send me unto Judah, unto the city of my father's sepulchres, that I may build it. And the king said unto me, the queen also sitting by him who was probably, Queen Esther and, therefore, abundantly agreeable that such a work should be done for her own nation. The king said unto me. 6. For how long shall your journey be? And when will you return? So it pleased the king to send me, and I set him a time. He was a valued servant. They did not wish to part with him and if he would go for a time to do this business, yet they took steps to assure he would return. There are some servants that I know of, who, if they were to go away, their masters would not be particularly anxious that they should come back again. 
It is well when a man is so in favor with God that his piety acts upon his ordinary life and he becomes in favor with men, also. That is a poor, miserable religion that does not make its possessor a good servant. Yes, in whatever station of life we may be placed, we ought to be far more valuable to those round about us on account of our fearing God. May we always be of such a character that if we were gone, we should be missed. I set him a time.